so we'll be discussing about approach to ilds in next one hour so as we know interstitial lung diseases are a group of disorders having generalized involvement of lung interstitium so interstitium is a kind of connective tissue which is present between the alveolar sacs or a secondary pulmonary lobule so it is uh, actually a collection of many different diseases of multiple etiologies and these disorders are labeled as ILD because of the common clinical, radiological and histological manifestations. As you can see in this slide of classification of ILDs, it is just to sensitize you, we will be discussing this again later, that it is a vast group. It contains multiple diseases like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the most important disease in the ILD. So whenever we are talking about ILD, first thing we have to do is to rule out whether it is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or whether it is not anything else. So first we classify it whether it is IPF or non-IPF. In non-IPF, all these things are included, but IPF is the most important disease. Other than that, there are diseases like uh, non-specific interstitial pneumonia, which we call as NSIP, respiratory bronchiolitis, interstitial lung disease, RBLD. These are the short forms we'll be using later on. Discomative interstitial pneumonia, which we call as DIP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, acute interstitial pneumonia, then autoimmune diseases, all kinds of autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Chagres syndrome, SLE, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, they all can cause ILDs. Uh, then other diseases like sarcoidosis, hypersensitive pneumonitis, they all can present as interstitial lung diseases. Uh, there are some rare diseases like LAM, LCH, drug-induced ILDs or uh, ILDs due to occupational exposure, vasculitis or other rare causes. We'll be discussing them in later. So now purpose of this slide is to understand that ILD is a group of multiple different diseases of multiple different etiologies. Uh, understanding them may be complex and our main aim is to classify whether they are IPF or non-IPF. Why to classify them as IPF or non-IPF? Because the prognosis of IPF is poor. So usually the patients of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis survive for three years. The mean year survival is like three years. Other diseases, they have slightly better survival. So it is important to differentiate whether he has IPF so that we can start treatment early and the treatment approach is obviously different for the both diseases and at least uh, delay the progression of disease and add years to patient's life. So the part to diagnosis of a long and tortuous symptom onset to diagnosis often takes one to two years and patients may be misdiagnosed with bronchitis, asthma, COPD, emphysema, heart, heart disease, all kinds of diseases. So early and accurate diagnosis allows timely initiation of appropriate therapy. But how to approach and how to diagnose the patient as ILD when the DDs are so broad? Cough and breathlessness can be due to multiple reasons like asthma, uh, GERD, COPD, ILD, bronchitis, lung cancer, or cardiac causes like um, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension. So it becomes difficult definitely to reach at a diagnosis. So first thing that helps us is history. So the history is most important thing. Uh, so basics are always first. Any patient with chronic exertional dyspnea, patient saying that he is having breathlessness for a long time, one month, two months, three months, six months. So it is definitely a chronic disease. It is not a short uh, acute disease. Chronic cough with or without expectation, fatigue. These all things clinch a diagnosis that patient is having some chronic condition. When you examine the patient, if there are Velcro-like crackles, so I uh, strongly advise everyone to get accustomed to these kinds of crafts. They are fine crafts. So whenever we are uh, examining the patient, patient may have multiple type of crafts. So we have learned in our undergraduate days, coarse crafts may be due to fluid or may be due to resolving pneumonia. But these are the fine crafts, which uh, sound like Velcro when you are... Uh, uh, well, I hope everyone has seen when we are uh, removing the Velcro, there is there's some fine sound, Velcro-like records. So they clears the diagnosis, there is some ILD. Clubbing, again, is a very important thing. If the patient is having chronic breathlessness with clubbing and patient is old age, it is a strong possibility that he may be having ILD because other diseases which are having clubbing in respiratory are bronchitis and lung cancer. So lung cancer will not have a long history. Bronchic tests will have coarse crypts, not fine crypts. So clubbing with fine crypts, again, clinches to diagnosis of ILD. Then if we can uh, perform PFTs like DLCO or uh, these tests, it is okay. But if you do not have access to these tests, no need to worry. Exertional desaturation, again, is an important thing. Patient says that his SpO2 is normal at rest, but whenever he walks for uh, even 100 meters, his SpO2 falls dramatically. 
so again it points to the uh, presence of ILDs and chest radiographs may be non-specific or may be having reticular infiltrates. One more thing is age. If the patient is more than 60 years of age with chronic uh, history of breathlessness, he may be having either ILD or COPD because both these diseases present usually in old ages. So, uh, as we have discussed that it is a multidisciplinary thing, we have to involve radiologists, we have to involve pathologists, and obviously clinician is there. So, uh, knowing about the radiology is the cornerstone of diagnosing ILD. And uh, if you do not know how to see x-rays and how to see a CT film, it is very difficult to diagnose because radiologists may miss sometimes, but you are the one who has to think about that and who has to suspect that your yeah, patient may be having ILD at least on the basis of x-ray. So we'll be just taking a short recap of radiology, lung radiology. So on x-ray, there may be high density, four high density patterns, increased density patterns. It is maybe consolidation, it may be interstitial shadows, it may be nodules, or it may be masses. So we are more interested about interstitial shadows, which is involvement of the supporting tissue of lung parenchyma, resulting in fine or coarse reticular opacities or small nodules. So these type of shadows, if you are getting on X-ray, they cleave towards the presence of ILD. Consolidation, usually in seen in pneumonia and other conditions, nodules may be present in ILD or may not be present. Masses usually are seen in malignancy. So these are multiple x-rays. I hope uh, the screen is visible to everyone. They can appreciate. So these are all consolidation patterns and tesis pattern. These, this type of x-rays uh, raises the suspicion that the patient may be having ILD, fine reticular pattern or coarse reticular pattern. So we can see the interstitial markings are increased in these x-rays. Uh, nodular pattern can also be there in ILD, but it is usually present in sarcoidosis or hypersensitive pneumonitis. So these patterns are important to identify reticular patterns. So you have to realize that it is not always possible to divide lung abnormalities into one of these four patterns, but should not be a problem. Sometimes you are confronted with an abnormality that looks like a mass, but it could also be consolidation. So we have to do workup. So there may be more than one patterns in same X-ray and it is not always clear cut. So again, talking about this, that previous X-ray, which was having reticular shadows on X-ray, so when we did CT of this patient, we saw this pattern. So we have to acquaint ourselves with this CT pattern. This is the pattern of interstitial lung diseases. So what we can see here, we have to learn uh, how to see and how to identify ILDs. We can see there is some septal thickening. So what is septa, we'll be discussing later. We can see there is some bronchiectasis. So the bronchiectasis seen in ILD is known as fractional bronchiectasis because it is secondary to fibrosis. It is not that bronchiectasis which is seen in uh, cystic fibrosis or other diseases, TB related bronchiectasis. It is traction bronchiectasis. So we can see here, the. Uh, I hope my arrows are visible. So we can see the airways are dilated here. There is septal thickening and there is some honeycomb. What are these things we'll be learning later, but just acquaint yourself with this image. So this is the image of ILD. Again, uh, X-ray with interstitial abnormalities, so reticular patterns. Uh, one more thing is to note that all uh, reticular opacities are not ILD. Suppose in this X-ray, this was the old film which patient had and now presented in this X-ray. So we can see it is due to pulmonary edema. So pulmonary edema, what it does is it causes fluid overload and since the veins are present in uh, interstitium, so the interstitium becomes prominent even in pulmonary edema also. And one thing which we can see in pulmonary edema is curly B lines. So what are curly B lines? Curly B lines are subtural lines which are two to three centimeter long and horizontal lines on the periphery of the lung. Okay. So if we are seeing curly B lines with a reticular pattern, it is likely due to pulmonary edema and it is not likely due to ILD. So it is important to identify on X-ray which patients may be having ILD or which may be not. One more pattern with some nodules and interstitial abnormalities. So this patient had sarcoidosis. Now talk about the CT pattern. For learning the CT, what we have to know is secondary pulmonary lobule. So secondary pulmonary lobule is the basic anatomic unit of pulmonary structure and function. It contains about uh, 5 to 15 SNI and it measures 1 to 2 centimeter. It contains a central bronchiole central uh, arteriole and in the periphery there is a septa which contains lymphatics and veins. So it is important to know that this is the secondary pulmonary lobule. 
periphery contains veins and lymphatics center contains the airway and artery so anything which is affecting the airway or which is affecting the artery which will be having a pro problem in the center of the lobule anything which is affecting the veins or lymphatics will be having issues in the septa or the periphery of the lobule under normal conditions only few of these very thin septa can be seen so this septa is usually not seen in uh, normal conditions on hrct but these septa become prominent in diseased conditions like interstitial lung diseases pulmonary edema or anything so i hope this image is clear so we were talking about this in previous slide central lobular area is the site of disease that enters the lung through the airways like hypersensitivity pneumonitis respiratory bronchiolitis or central lobular emphysema so anything which is causing airways so hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a disease which is caused due to aeroborne allergens or organic dust exposure which uh, is usually known as farmer's lung or um, uh, how part of pneumonitis there are multiple different interesting names of hp so these occurs via airway so it affects central lobular area but perilymphatic area this area is uh, usually involved in disease process of lymphatics like sarcoidosis lymphangiectasis carcinomatosis or pulmonary edema so whenever we see ct we have to identify which areas are predominantly affected whether they are the central lobular areas or perilymphatic areas and that will point out to the underlying disease what kind of diseases are there so in ct there may be a dominant pattern of reticulation nodulation or higher attenuation like consolidation or lower attenuation like cis uh, distribution in central lobule can be central lobular or perilymphatic or random it may be upper zone or lower zone this distribution significantly affects the diagnosis as we'll be seeing later so the reticular pattern is important to know because this is the predominant pattern in interstitial lung diseases reticular pattern is uh, there when there are too many lines either as a result of septal thickening or as in honeycombing so you can see here in ct scan there are some lines i hope everyone can appreciate there are too many lines so this is known as reticular pattern it may be due to septal thickening also or it may be due to honeycomb also so again in this x ray also there are uh, reticular patterns multiple lines on scene but the difference is you can see there is a mass here so mass with reticulation this patient was later diagnosed to having uh, lymphangiectasis carcinomatosis so this malignancy was spreading by lymphatics that's why there was a reticular pattern this patient was having cardiogenic pulmonary edema so that's why there was uh, reticular so only ct will not clinch the diagnosis uh, obviously you have to have a uh, detailed history also but you have to know that what patterns we have to look for in what patients this was the patient with cardiogenic pulmonary edema we can see there is some effusion also and there is a presence of septal thing so the secondary pulmonary nodule is beautifully seen in this ct see i hope everyone can appreciate so these are the septa which become prominent on ct scan usually they are not seen like in this area in septa are not seen or very thin but in this area we can clearly see there are septal thickening Uh, due to cardiogenic pulmonary edema so pulmonary edema causes increased pressure in the veins veins run in periphery in the connective tissue septa of the lobule so they become prominent and the septa become prominent low attenuation patterns can be honeycombing traction bronchitis lung cis or emphysema so two things which we have to know is honeycombing and tractional bronchitis for diagnosing ild honeycombing means small cyst which are sub plural means in the periphery of the lung and which are layered in multiple layers two or three layers we can see this this first layer 1 2 3 4 second layer 1 2 3 4 5 third layer so there is stacked multi layered cyst which are present in the periphery of the lung is called as honeycomb because it looks like honeycomb obviously tractional bronchitis is the dilatation of airway usually in the periphery of the lung due to the underlying fibrosis so the fibrosis lung is pulling the airways which is causing the dilatation so it is called as traction bronchitis these two things are main patterns in the ct of the patients so honeycombing how it looks on the uh, ct is we uh, we have already discussed there are multiple cysts we can see here these are the cystic patterns which are sub plural multiple stacked cysts in multiple layers and there is some tractional bronchitis
so honey combing is the hallmark of interstitial lung diseases honey combing can be seen in multiple interstitial lung diseases like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis rheumatoid arthritis uh, scleroderma asbestosis in stage hp or in stage sarcoidosis these all uh, patterns usually is known as usual interstitial pneumonia which we'll be discussing later what is the uip pattern and uh, it uh, usually it is characterized by presence of honeycomb